Welcome. This is the, 12, uh, the 11.30 session from day two of Dawn or Doom 2018. It's a technology journalists panel. How to explain technology so you're spellbound. It'll be moderated by our illustrious dean of the Purdue College of Liberal Arts, David Rheingold. We're pleased to once again have an accomplished group of journalists join us this year to talk about covering technology in ways that are both interesting and also inform us about the deep impact many new technologies are having on our lives. Dave Bangert is a veteran, a veteran columnist for the Journal and Courier and Gannett, who writes about myriad topics, from politics to e-scooters, of local, state, and national interest and issues facing Greater Lafayette and Purdue, always with an emphasis on the human interest in his stories and the people affected by them. Marina Corin is Senior Associate Editor at The Atlantic, where she covers science and space exploration. She's worked at the National Journal, the Smithsonian Magazine, Popular Mechanics, and Psychology Today. She's written about failed Mars simulations, NASA's workplace culture, dreamy pictures of Jupiter, and recently the Trump administration's proposal for a space force. Alison Snyder, is the managing editor of Axios and also leads a newsletter on artificial intelligence and automated vehicles. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Daily Beast, Scientific American, the Scientist, and the Lancet. She is a scientist turned journalist with degrees in chemical engineering and botany. The discussion today will be moderated by David Rheingold, who is the moral dean of the College of Liberal Arts and a professor of sociology at Purdue. Prior to his appointment here, Dean Rheingold was a professor and executive associate dean at the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. His teaching and research areas include urban poverty, economic development, social welfare policy, low-income housing, government performance, and civil society. That latter topic is certainly a subject of concern involving technology social media technology in particular today. It's my pleasure to welcome Dean Rangold and our columnists. Please take a moment to silence all electronic devices, but do feel free to tweet using hashtag dawn or doom. David. All right, thank you, Jerry. And good morning, everyone. We're delighted you're here to join us for this terrific panel with a number of fabulous guests from the world of journalism and the media. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and have a bit of a discussion here for about the first 30 minutes of our session, and then uh, we'll open it up for some questions uh, from the audience here for the second half. We've got a couple microphones, so uh, as we get a little bit further in the program, we'll ask you to step forward. You can interact with some of our guests here. So I guess we'll start with uh, uh, just a general question uh, about uh, sort of your current, tell us a little bit about your current position and uh, in the world of media and journalism, and what are some of the things that you most like about it? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I'm a, a managing editor at Axios. I started there uh, as a, I launched their science section and wrote a science newsletter and still sort of oversee that. Um, but I also oversee our network of external contributors who write about world news, energy, autonomous vehicles, science, a little bit of everything. Um, and so that's sort of, and I also, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, oversee an autonomous vehicles newsletter. Um, so you know, sort of looking at the technology, yes, but the impact on policy and just literally intersections with everyday life. Um, and what do I like most? A couple of things. I mean, I, if I had had my way, I would be a student forever. Um, so uh, become I, a professor. Yeah, That's, <laughs> that was that was one of the best. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I think one of the things I really love about journalism is the ability to just being able to talk to a lot of people, learning a lot, um, and being able. For me, I was um, you know I studied science. I was always thought I was going to be a scientist. Um, and I think one of the, the things I really enjoy is being able to contextualize the science and to really, you know, bring it out and drag it into other people's lives. Um, so those are the sort of the intellectual reasons I enjoy it. Terrific. Yeah. We'll swing it around. Um, yeah, I am a science reporter at The Atlantic, and I focus mostly on outer space. So that includes space science, space technology, politics, and policy. 
uh, and I spend my days talking to a mix of scientists who are working on cool projects, uh, officials uh, in Congress or at NASA or at SpaceX about what they're doing, and um, everyday people whose lives have been touched or affected by space exploration. Um, I don't have a science background, I do have a journalism background, so it's definitely been interesting to kind of learn uh, science that I didn't really catch um, in a school setting. And I think um, whenever I tell people that I am a science reporter and I'm a space reporter, they kind of giggle because it sounds a little bit ridiculous, you're a space reporter. Um, but the beat is as legitimate, I think, as any other. Um, there are still a lot of powerful people to hold accountable, scandals to uncover, um, internal turmoil to expose, and I think more and more as space exploration moves into the private sector and NASA kind of steps back and lets companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX do more, um, those scientists and engineers become public figures. And I think it's really interesting for science journalists to cover them as such and to let readers know what they're doing and hold them accountable as you would on any other beat. That's great. Well, I've been at the uh Journal and Courier since 1989. I had uh, three years in Lawrence, Kansas as a general assignment reporter covering county government and police and those kinds of things. Uh, I've had a lot of different jobs. My current job, I was assigned in 2011. Uh, a long story to get there, but uh, to basically go out and be a city columnist. Um, and I asked, what do you want me to do? And they said, go and be a city columnist. So I basically have uh, reported on what I feel is either underreported or needs to be done. Uh, I cover a lot of politics. I cover uh, a lot of Purdue, um, and I cover uh, just pretty much whatever uh, strikes strikes me. Uh, one day I was in the back of, of People's Brewing Company uh, writing about uh, some beer they were putting out, and they had a wall, a whiteboard, and I took a picture of the whiteboard, and Chris Johnson, the owner, said, "Don't." publish that because it was suggested names that they were going to do for beer. And many of them were a little racy and a little blue. Um, he said, I really don't want that out. We're going to scribble those out. And one of them was named Gene Ford. I said, well, what's Gene Ford? They, all of them were history. And it turned out Johnny Cash had written about a guy from Lafayette named Gene Ford that he met when he stopped his tour bus in Lafayette and uh, told the story in, on the Rambler record, which was a tiny little Johnny Cash thing, but he said one day Johnny Cash stopped at the Wabash, fished, and then wrote a song if it, if it wasn't for the Wabash River. So I went and tried to find Gene Ford, and that became a story. I'd like to do that kind of thing, too. Did you find him? I didn't, but I did find uh, there are people who believe that that Gene Ford lived on Wabash Avenue. There is a Gene Ford that went to Lafayette Jeff who was a sophomore two years in a row, according to the yearbook, so it kind of fits the story. Uh, but I can't find him. I'm still looking. Uh, that's all right. So um, uh, I can't help uh, but ask, today's uh, election day, and, and there's a lot of scrutiny on the media and a lot of, a lot of uh, heated rhetoric about uh, the media. And, and I, you know, how, how is, that is that affecting you in any way in terms of your reporting on technology? Uh, and tech, uh, uh, and, and you know, we hear a lot about uh, sort of enemies of the people and that sort of thing. How 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 is it? How is that affecting you and your work? I'll go first. Um, well, it is no secret that the president and his administration think that we're enemies of the people, and I would say the answer is no. We're not, <laughs> are we? Um, it's. I mean, it's. A president griping about how the, pres uh, the press treats his administration is not a new thing. Um, I think it was George Washington who liked to call the press infamous scribblers. Um, but it is also true that this administration has come up with a particular brand of criticism against the press that is dangerous and damaging. And that does make our jobs harder, at least it makes my job harder. Because often when I want to talk to people and want to talk to sources while I'm reporting, Sometimes they're ready to, you know, they think I'm lying even before I speak, and that is a difficult barrier to, to get over. Um, but I think it's important to remember that, you know, that the press is not this, this machine that exists, you know, in Washington and other pockets of the country. Um, it is a, an important part of a pillar of the Constitution, and it is a right of every American to 
write what they think, to read what they believe, to publish what they think. And so um, it makes me a little sad to see that, you know, when, you know, politicians are, sw are uh, sworn in to, you know, serve and protect and defend the Constitution, and freedom of the press is part of that. Everyone is welcome to critique the press, but when you, know, when you go and attack it as part of a constitutional right, that is, uh, is difficult, and it does make, I think, our jobs hard day to day. Uh, yeah, you know, when uh, the Boston Globe, just about two or three months ago, did a whole, they encouraged every editorial board in the nation to write why we're not enemies of the people. I wrote a column basically saying that that wasn't gonna turn the Trump supporters that I knew um, and many of them who I consider good sources and friends. And I told a story about uh, when Todd Rokita, our congressman today, was gonna run for Senate. He was going around the state uh, having uh, uh, first time rallies or introducing his campaign. And as we were talking, it's in a room full of people that I quote on a regular basis about Lafayette things. Um, and he was talking about the media elite and you know how they were gonna take those down and I'm going to Washington again in Senate, we're gonna take that down. Um, and he had a, a particular beef about something I had written and pointed me out as he was talking about that. And here in this room of people who had asked me, have you signed up for 100 Men Who Cook? Have you, did you see how we're losing the Colt World Series? Can you help us get some housing for kids? That kind of thing. They all turned around and kind of did like, he's talking about you. And um, I kind of wish that, that the president could have seen something like that, that even when Todd Rokita, who thinks that I am against him in a lot of ways, could have seen that the room full of Trump supporters in that room who were very well respected and people that I trust and people who have learned to trust me personally, I believe, mm -hmm. that, that there was no enemy there. There was just, there, there was a completely, um, it was all based on the trust I had built with what they, what they were willing to tell me. But it seemed like more of a show. It was a show for the congressman to be able to say, liberal elite or media elite, which was hilarious because then I got in my 2010 Subaru hatchback with, uh, <laughs> with bad wheel bearings, you know, so um, different story. I don't know if you want to take a stab at that or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're, we're obviously absolutely not the enemy of the people, as Marina was saying. I mean, we are, we sort of are the people, right? We are the constitutional right yeah. of the people. Um, and I think you know, can we do better? Absolutely, we can always do better, right? Um, I think I'm really proud of, and I see it with Axios, but lots of places as well, like how quickly people correct and update their stories and sort of um, in this environment, you know, that they're, I think a lot of people are owning when there are mistakes. Um, but I think a lot of us also, we go into this field because we want to inform people, right? Like we want to give people um, the information that they need. Um, we're sort of obsessed with it, actually, I would argue. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and I think it, how it affects our, like, our daily work, so something you were saying, I feel like sometimes um, before we even open our mouth that, there's an, that we're seen as pushing an agenda and we're not here to push an agenda. Is there particular kinds of pressure you feel reporting on technology firms, uh, uh, you know, a university that knows it, or is known mainly for engineering or in, in, in science and technology that uh, as report as reporters reporting on some big powerful institutions that are sort of unique to uh, to your your slice of journalism so I'm more of an editor at this point so I'm, I feel like or, or do your do your journalists sort of do you have to are there issues that they face um, in what sense? Like uh, in terms of like just pressure from uh, or, or, or feeling like you have to tell the positive story. I don't think so. Uh -huh. I, I think um, I think we like our reporters um, and editors really sort of go after what they think is underreported, what is most important, um, and um, you know not everybody's happy, but. Right. Yeah, obviously, um, the powerful institutions, as you mentioned, they want to push you to write the positive stories. Um, and I think that that is a, a thing that science journalists really have to pay attention to, uh, especially on my beat with space exploration, because space, I think, is objectively really cool. Um, I was as mesmerized as anyone watching the video of the, um, 
SpaceX's side boosters landing back on Earth after the Falcon Heavy launch in unison. That was an incredibly um, just cool thing to see. Uh, but it's important for us as journalists to remember that it's not our job to, you know, marvel at this achievement and praise SpaceX for doing well and, and you know, bettering humanity. Uh, it's not our job to cheer them on. Mm. And I think that if we do focus on, like, the cool stuff that a tech company is doing, that SpaceX is doing, that Boeing is doing, um, it sets reporters up for missing the layers beneath that. Um, you know, sure, NASA is building one of the most powerful telescopes in the world right now, and it's going to succeed Hubble, and it's going to send back all kinds of pretty pictures. And I do want to write that kind of story. I want to tell readers how cool that is. But that telescope project is also years behind schedule and $800 million in taxpayer money over budget. So I think it's uh, science journalists have to strike a balance between pointing out um, achievements and commemorating certain things, but also being really critical and skeptical about that thing, too. And covering Purdue would be my example for that, is Purdue probably does a better job of telling its own story. Um, I can say that Purdue probably has, I, I don't know how the, the factor, but they have way more journalists here and media people putting out Purdue's story on a regular basis. Um, so it is interesting when I write it in parochial terms, national people come in and see a bigger story of tuition freezes and um, you know a lot of great things that we have written about but I tend to write also about the the you know things that affect people on health insurance which is a big deal right now um, you know a lot of things that aren't always totally positive um, but you know even sometimes when you write a positive story wrote about this new gateway that's coming to Purdue and what a great story and all the rest of it until a couple of former deans said, wait a minute, the one you're tearing down was a monument to a former dean of students. Mm -hmm. Becomes a different story. So a positive story becomes a nuanced story. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in the past year, what's been the, what's, what do you think has been the most overhyped tech uh, story mm -hmm. out there? Or that's getting way too much attention? I mean, I think- Or underhyped. Mm -hmm. or, or what's, uh, what's the story that sort of, is being underreported in, in the technology space. So um, I think in terms of area, I mean, AI is an area that is something that uh, is obviously overhyped. And when you were talking about striking a balance of having this nuance, um, you know, I think it, it's an area where it's kind of a shame because there are actually pretty amazing things that are happening pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think because people sometimes uh, expect so much from technology, whether it's because it's been overhyped or just they, they expect so much from it that they're, it's almost like a letdown, you know? Um, so, so I feel like AI is an area, um, autonomous vehicles is something we just launched a section on and are covering. Um, and uh, a lot of people are talking about the hype around that um, just in terms of, you know, uh, Elon Musk saying that you know autopilot will be available next year and then it's the next year and you know at the same time you've got people who are saying this could be decades away before there's a fully autonomous car that you can drive and to work every day um, and so sort of trying to cut through that I think is something that we're following and, and don't, working on. don't tell my eight-year-old son he's all set to never have to drive oh really <laughs> so, I don't know if that'll actually happen I, he can what, get a scooter yeah, yeah that's right well, they're, yeah they're all they're, they're all over um, adults ride them apparently for most of their lives now too, so. Good, good. so I don't know most overhyped most under under reported story in the uh, tech uh, area over the past year um, can I broaden it to tech and science? Can sure, really so tech and science, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say most underhyped would be climate change, uh -huh. <laughs> um, particularly as it relates to space exploration, because um, space science and space policy has always been a bipartisan policy and effort. And so I think sometimes science journalists can, including myself, struggle to, when we write about space science, kind of inject that piece of, you know, the story of climate change into that because for so long, we kind of didn't really have to. Um, and it feels, it feels a little uncomfortable or forced or unnatural sometimes to try to inject the story of climate change into a story about exoplanets or the story about you know, other space science. But I think increasingly that um, climate change is becoming a science and space and technology story um, because we live on the only livable planet. And I think that that's something that 
um, space journalism in particular still has to kind of reckon with. Uh, you know, NASA's administrator is a Republican who um, says he believes all of the troubling reports about climate change that are coming out, but um, very explicitly says that he won't talk to any of his colleagues in the Republican Party about that. And so I think that climate change as a story is showing up more in, in more and more beats, uh, and it's going to continue to. I would go with underreported. I think that's just starting to get some attention in Indiana is rural broadband. Um, you talk about drive, uh, autonomous cars, it's not gonna happen until rural broadband happens. That's the story here. Uh, great, report, great study out of, uh, uh, that Wally Tyner here at Purdue did about where Indiana stood and what are the best chances of getting rural broadband out and how uh, Tipmont REMC here in, in, in Tippecanoe and Montgomery County is rolling it out on their own, trying to get out, realizing that the jobs could go to neighboring places like Fountain County and just tiny places that have lost everybody. They can get health care, they can get jobs, that, that jobs won't go without having reliable broadband. I think that's gonna be a big deal. The backstage we were, I was, I was asking uh, our, our guests uh, about a piece that was in the New York Times, I think last week, uh, uh, sort of reporting on uh, Silicon Valley executives and their schools that they send their kids to and that they apparently, according to this piece, are uh, lobbying to get as much technology removed from their, the schools that they send their kids to. And, um, and, and the schools that tend to have the most technology in them are now schools that serve uh, students that are perhaps the most disadvantaged. And, I, and I'm sort of, when I was reading that piece, I, I kept thinking to myself, you know, we've been through a period of about uh, at least a decade or, or a couple decades where tech and science have been really cool. And, um, and I'm sort of wondering whether or not, you know, are, do, you, do, you, do you feel like that's still the case? Uh, or are we at a tipping point where the, 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 the sort of broader cultural environment is sort of, I don't know, getting a little bit exhausted by the science and tech uh, uh, craze of the past uh, 20 plus years? Hmm. Well, there's probably a reason why I've got my vinyl out again. I mean, because <laughs> I really do, it sounds weird, but I actually enjoy getting up every 20 minutes and taking the needle off the record. Uh, there, is a, there is a down time to that, um, but you know, I, 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 at, at where, where my daughter goes to school at Lafayette Jeff, it's been a one-to-one -one school since she's been a freshman. She has a, a surface she goes to school with, no textbooks except at the school, and, uh, and I can tell you she hates it because it's, it can be unreliable. So I hear more about that than about her teachers, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure that, that the school is ready to make that disappear. Yeah. And I'm not advocating, I was just sort of wondering, you know. Well, it, if sounds like, it sounds like people who sell paint now not painting with the paint they're selling right, or, because or, it's Well, that's toxic. what the article seemed to su suggest, mm. but I, I'm not sure if that's exactly the case. I, I also think you're not, I've said this backstage, I mean, you can't put it back in the box, right? So um, I, don't, I, don't, I feel like it's such an, uh, a part of obviously everyone's lives, including children right now. Um, and so. What comes of that? I don't know. I mean, I think, and there, you know, I, maybe someone else can speak to this more than I can. But you know, there are uh, studies about technology's effect on, on children, and um, you know, sort of trying to really understand what that screen time means. And it seems like um, right now the science is still out. To, you know, the verdict is still out. Well, we had the discussion last night at dinner, time. just after the talk about cell phones and how, how it's too much smartphone <laughs> in your life all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and the conversation, uh, kind of like when uh, Judge Kavanaugh said you made the reference to UB40, you know, there was a cutoff on having the fight with a guy who looks like UB40. All of a sudden, you knew who was 40 and over. You know, it was a nice thing. The, um, what the conversation was, do you remember a time where you weren't able to get in touch with people and you missed out on something? Which was the, my life in high school and college was if you missed people by a minute, you had no chance of catching up. Um, whereas now, my daughter, it's nothing to, to keep up that way. I, so the, the led to what is 20 years from now that you're going to say, what was that moment? And I have a hard time imagining technology getting so much better, but I have a hard time not imagining not being able to imagine it, you know, that 
it'll be telekinesis or something will be the next thing. Um, I can't, I can't tell. Yeah, I think the path um, from really loving tech and being excited about it and then um, thinking that it's creepy and taking over our lives and this backlash that manifests in many ways, including these Silicon Valley executives that you mentioned pulling away from that, I think that was always going to happen You know, when the technology matured and children started using it. It's just because kids are able to use tablets from age five that we are now thinking about this. Uh, and the fact that, you know, Silicon Valley executives are the best people to know, I think, about the harmful effects of certain types of technology and smartphone technology in children. And in that way, it's, they're no different than a school administrator in a, maybe a low income or run down school district sending their kids to a really fancy school. You know, they know what technology overuse can do to children and they want to protect their kids from that. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an old story. It's just adapted now for the times. So I've got, uh, I think I've got a couple more questions here, and then hopefully we'll get uh, some, some of our guests in the audience to come forward and, and uh, ask, ask some additional questions of the panel. Uh, uh, almost 60 years ago, C.P. Snow, who was this Oxford Don, uh, who uh, was a chemist and also wrote uh, literature, uh, talked about the two-culture problem where, in his language, the scientists didn't really communicate with the intellectuals. I don't think the scientists liked the fact that uh, he used the other group uh, and called them intellectuals, but, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's neither here nor there. And, um, and over those past, and, there's, and we've talked, uh, and there's been a fair amount of discussion, I think, over the past couple decades about this two-culture issue and how do you break it down, how do you foster more integration. Uh, but I'm also mindful that uh, there's such hyper-specialization even within you know, the science and technology worlds. Um, I, do you find, I guess, do you find that the, that the world of science and technology, that it's become so hyper-specialized that uh, the people that are in it actually are not actually communicating with each other, that they're sort of each communicating in their very sort of narrow tranches, and they, they're not even quite aware of what's happening elsewhere? And, and how does that hyper-specialization sort of affect the ability of the rest of us uh, to keep up and know what's going on uh, in this space. Yeah, so I definitely, um, I hear from a lot of scientists who um, will say, and I think there was a study about this too, that will talk about um, the inaccessibility of other scientific papers um, and sort of, you know, that, that, that it, because it's so hyper-specialized, it's, uh, it's just impossible sometimes to even to check each other, right? Um, and so I think you carry that the next step and sort of the question is how you know, how then, when you talk about technologies like machine learning and quantum computing that have such an immensely high barrier to entry, um, because I don't know about you, but I did not take quantum physics, mm -hmm. and um, I, so it's very hard to, to write about and understand and to sort of actually understand how those technologies are progressing and what the potential impact will be. Um, and I think that's where journalists can come in, and I think those are especially sort of highly trained and, um, but also, you know, that's for science, that's the, the responsibility is also with the scientists there. Um, and I actually think, when I was thinking about the C.P. Snow issue, I, I would argue that it's sort of flipped in a way that um, I think a lot of people in the humanities, or I guess the intellectuals in his construct, um, have, have a pretty, very good knowledge of science. Um, and I don't know if it's a, um, a reflection of what you're talking about earlier, that technology and science had a period of being very cool, um, and it was everywhere, and people, you know, were reading about it, and there's a lot more options in the popular press. Um, but I think that, um, in a way, there's more appreciation that way, perhaps, than the other way, and that maybe scientists have a lot to learn from um, from the humanities. And you see that particularly with AI, where, um, you know, Google and all of these companies now talk about having ethicists and philosophers and coming up with ethical guidelines. And there's obviously a lot of work to be done there, um, but I do think there is an awareness of that. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it's great. <laughs> um, yeah, as Allison said, I think that journalists are part of the solution. If there is still a disconnect, um, I think the solution is always to hire more journalists and <laughs> ask scientists questions. Um, but I do have some beef with C.P. Snow, because in that essay, he. Um, when he was describing scientists and their language and how inaccessible it was to the intellectuals, uh, he said that, you know, if I asked a scientist to what does mass or acceleration or another complex subject mean to you, 
um, Snow said that he didn't accept, he didn't expect um, a good answer, a simple answer. But he's not asking good questions. Um, you know, the way to ask a scientist to tell you his or her story is not to say, you know, what does X mean? What does this mean? Um, I think you need to say things like, can you give me an analogy that you think would um, be relatable to the average person to explain this? Uh, can you explain that again, but talk to me as if I'm a sixth grader? I think part of the problem if there is a disconnect between two groups who can't really communicate because they are highly specialized in their thinking is because the people in between, the journalists, are not asking good enough questions. Hmm. Interesting. I can't do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> hire more journalists. <laughs> yeah, well, hire more journalists. And, that's, and that, I think, comes to another thing is, is that's not happening. Um, I mean, newsrooms are shrinking. I mean, you can, that's not fake news. Um, and uh, I can tell you in my own course of work, uh, I don't have time to do the columns I was doing five years ago that were more context, uh, context and some opinion and you know some personal things because I'm covering things that we don't have reporters to cover now and I believe need to be covered. Mm -hmm. So I'm covering should utility lines be at run through the Prophetstown State Park in today's paper where someone else probably would have covered that five years ago, and I might have come back with a context piece about how that fits in with everything else. I think we're running a lot harder uh, to cover just the basics right now. So if, if we have any aspiring journalists in the audience who are interested in uh, covering science and technology, what advice would you have for them? How do they get started? Hmm. Okay, so one of the first gigs that I ever took was I had a professor who was, um, he wrote obituaries on the side and he, he was taking, he was an adjunct professor and he was going to take another, um, another role and he couldn't take it on and he asked me if I wanted to do it and I thought, oh, I don't, do I really want to write obituaries about, uh, it was mostly medical doctors. Um, and I said yes, and I still do it today, and it's like one of the best things I would, I've done because I was able to learn about the history of medicine because most of these people were, you know, had been born in the 20s. Um, and so you could hear just sort of by talking to their colleagues how much the field had changed, you know, there's this pre-DNA structure, things like that. Um, so my point is, uh, I, I, I'm sort of an advocate for always saying yes to every opportunity, whether it be, if, I mean, I don't think a lot of people aspire to write obituaries, um, but it's been probably the, one of the most useful things uh, I've done. That's and most good. interesting and, you know, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, I think, uh, so there's a couple of ways into science journalism. You can either come from a science background, um, you know, go to grad school, do some research, and then switch over to journalism. Or uh, you can do journalism first and then move into science, um, which is what I've done. and. Um, yeah, I would, I don't know which path is better. I mean, I certainly wish I had, I took physics, my one and only physics class, senior year of high school, and I skipped a lot of classes that year <laughs> that I very much regret doing. Um, but I think it is okay to not have a, a really serious and strict science background if you want to get into science writing. Um, I'd argue that it's almost maybe even a little bit more important to have some journalism um, foundational knowledge because there is so much about science writing that is more than writing. It's reporting and it's hardcore reporting. Mm -hmm. And you have to know how to talk to sources, how to cultivate relationships with them, um, you know, what conflicts of interest to avoid, um, what on earth deep background means and how to propose that to a source. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have a, an intense science background and you want to be a science writer, uh, I think that it, it can be done that you can learn on the job using the journalistic skills that you have. Um, and just being, uh, you know, as a journalist, you, your job is to ask questions. And there are a lot smarter people out there than I am and I depend on them to tell me the answers to those questions. So at the end of the day, I don't feel so, so, so bad that I don't have a science or tech background. I think the same, the same the same applies to general reporting as applies to anything. You could have asked that about politics, about sports, about anything. Uh, you're never gonna be the expert in the room. You're always gonna be the one who tries to be competent to explain what the expert's about. Um, you mentioned obit writing. My first job, one of the jobs we had was, uh, there were three funeral homes in Lawrence and they all called one desk and the editor said, obit. And everybody, if you weren't busy, 
you had to raise your hand. And it wasn't that the editors wanted you to raise your hand, it was everybody else knew who was busy. And if you didn't take your shots at doing the obits, it was a problem. But what I learned about that was obituaries taught me to be very accurate. Because mm -hmm. the worst thing you could do is get things wrong in the last thing that's gonna appear about somebody in the paper. And it mattered. Um, and I take, uh, when I get to write an obituary, and I write quite a few as well now as columns, um, I take it very seriously, and I actually find some joy in it, not that the person died, but that I have a reason to say, here's why we should celebrate or mark this person's passing. Yeah, I guess that, like, that would be the thing. I think some people think you want to you want to just rock it up there, um, you know, to a, to a, maybe a national position or something like a national publication. But I think um, like my my actually my biggest regret was that I didn't spend time covering like a, a, you know a court the courts in the city or something like that. Um, I obviously came to this a little later. Um, I don't have a, well I have a journalism background, but I started as a scientist. Um, so I think, yes, I agree with both of you. And I mean, it's funny you were saying it's okay to not have a, a science background. I tend to think it might be an advantage. Um, oh, there's some is. debate yeah. about this. I think yeah. it's actually a big advantage. Yeah. yeah. And there's no rocketing to anywhere right. in journalism. <laughs> I had about seven internships before yeah. I had my first real <laughs> yeah. job. And I, I found that there was real value when I was hiring people. I always said, my goal is two years from now, you are rocketing somewhere else, yeah. wherever it is you want to go, because then I've got what I want out of you as well. But a lot of people have found that having to cover everything and being called out of the blue to go to a fire or go to a science convention or go to last minute to go cover a high school football game taught you to do everything and anything and be fearless. What I would tell people is just be fearless in being able to be told no and the silence you get sometimes. And I agree, it really is about how to report because that took me the longest to learn. Uh, the writing was easy and eventually just came, well, it, that was just the simple part. The reporting was the hard part and it, it was amazing to me that my, my writing got so much better when I learned how to report. Mm -hmm. the reporting is still hard. It is. Yeah. So I wanna invite any of our uh, guests in the audience to come forward and, and ask some questions we've got a uh, mic here and a mic there. And, and while people are coming forward, I did want to ask one uh, quick question about uh, Vince Cerf, who has the title of Chief Internet Evangelist at Google and is one of the sort of founders of the internet uh, among many founders. He has an article which um, is, is bemoaning, uh, came out I think earlier this week, bemoaning the fact that we've had so much technological advancement over the past couple decades but very little evidence that there's much progress in terms of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I guess I was gonna ask you in terms of your interactions with scientists and, and, and technologists, you know, what's, are, are, is, there, is, that, is that a fair, is that a fair uh, critique? Uh, our, our sci in, in your interactions and reporting, are scientists and, and technologists actually trying to improve uh, humanity um, is that their motivation, or is there is is are they are they trying are, are is there are they motivated to do to do other things? I think at their best they are if uh, science at its best um, is an inherently optimistic pursuit, a human endeavor. Um, but there, it certainly falls short at times, right? There are countless examples of times when um, it was it, we were, we were, well. The key thing is human endeavor, right? Where human um, behaviors and biases and desires have um, not lived up to that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I was, as you were asking a question, I was thinking about whether or not that was actually one of the was happiness one of the promises of the internet. And I don't know the answer to that. Like I don't remember. I don't know like what the sort of. Um, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Don't know. <laughs> happiness, revenue. Happiness. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> happiness for some. <laughs> it seems like well. Yeah, it seems like the, the question of happiness of a society is kind of separate from um, technology because, you know, smartphones, apps like Instagram, Facebook, Google, they're just reflections of, what, of real life, and they are real life now. And so if we're not happy on the apps, it's not because of the apps. Hmm, I can't improve. You know, all right, we're going we're gonna, to, if you could maybe introduce yourself and then ask your question. Thank you. My name is Karen Griggs. I'm from West Lafayette. Sometimes Mississippi and Indiana are uh, at the bottom of the list in various measures. 
I was up in Flint, Michigan, and a consultant for the public library told me that uh, one way to fund public access in public libraries is to follow the example of Ohio, where one cent of the sales tax goes to public libraries. But here in Indiana, there are 35 counties with no public library system. So I wondered if there are other places around the country that exhibit um, this, this gap in access. I know that rural broadband is an issue, but uh, let's probe that subject just briefly. Are there other places around the country with no library access, no public library, no broadband? Dave, I don't. Well, I, you know, I can, I can point back. I, I wish I had uh, that study that Wally Tyner did. He, they actually did look at where broadband was in Indiana and where it wasn't. I know you don't have to go very far outside of Lafayette and West Lafayette to be on uh, DSL that comes through, I mean, or I'm gonna get that all messed up. They get it through the air. It's almost like a Wi-Fi that comes from a pole that's a mile and a half away, and it's unreliable and very slow. Um, and it was, a, it was a big problem across Indiana. I don't think we have to go very far to figure, figure that out. I know that here at the libraries, I actually go and do my work at the libraries because the access is so good, um, and they've made, a, made progress there. I'm not sure about the rest of the nation. Well, I wonder if this is a symptom of general anti-intellectualism based on what Congressman Rokita says or um, on what other public policy people have said ever since Bureau Agnew. Do you see anti-intellectualism bubbling up in the mud? In terms of what, what Congressman Rokita is saying, I mean, many of his many people who really like him use technology all the time, and I think that we, we just have to look at how social media is used. I don't know that, that they're against that. Now, they may be against intellectualism, um, which is a different story than just technology, I would think, having spoken to the congressman. Not always talking to him. I wish we could talk more, but, um, but that's part of... Uh, where he's been. Have you guys followed any stories about uh, library access around the country? Not recently. No. Oh, sorry. The libraries are great. <laughs> so it sounds like a, a, a question for uh, further discussion, a good question. Mm -hmm. We'll go over it right here. Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm from Dyer, Indiana, and I'm a freshman here in computer science. Uh, my question stems from the title of this panel specifically. Uh, what specific things do you do in your writing to make them make the technical topics understandable to a layman and keep them spellbound? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I have thesaurus.com open at every moment <laughs> of the hour. Um, well, so I so I often cover um, new research studies, science and technology, and. I don't know if you've ever looked at a scientific study that is not written in English. It's very difficult for un to understand. And sometimes I don't even attempt to read it in full, but I call um, at least four people about that and have them explain it to me and ask them over and over again until I understand it. Uh, I think a big part of of being a science reporter is not being afraid of sounding dumb to someone who's much smarter than you. Because if you don't understand the subject matter, then your readers aren't going to. And um, sometimes it can happen that you know a 40 minute phone call with the scientist becomes one sentence in your story, but that's because you needed to really boil it down for the reader. And then that's where thesaurus.com comes in and you throw in some pretty adjectives to keep it spellbound, as you said. <laughs> We have, um, so our, our format for our stories is quite different if, um, if you haven't seen it, but a lot of times we will use, we call them axioms to, um, we've borrowed the word from the scientists and mathematicians, um, uh, to help readers sort of through a story, um, you know, pretty efficiently. And the one that we use the most, because someone did a, uh, an audit of Axios recently, which is quite funny um, and, and pretty revealing, but um, 
the one we use the most is why this matter, why it matters. And so for me, when I'm reporting a story, that's actually the starting point for me. And I usually end up coming back to it too. Like, why, why does this matter? And if it matters to you as the scientist, tell me why. Um, and why should it matter to me or why should it matter to any of us? Um, and so that's like a very good prism, I think, for making it accessible too, because it forces them to A, sort of you know, uh, explain it in a way that's accessible, um, but also it's a, a, an ability to tie it back to um, to our everyday lives or to you know public policy or t to tie it to anything that's beyond science itself. Yeah, I threw my thesaurus away a long time ago. I'm a little afraid of fancy words, <laughs> but um, and I don't cover a lot of science and tech. But uh, I example would be the the pilot projects going on at Purdue right now about making sure that you can't watch Netflix in the biggest lecture halls. Um, I understand not being able to use Netflix in the giant lecture halls, but I had to work backwards from that to say why. And to me, I didn't understand that if you have too many Wi-Fi points, eventually they compete and hurt themselves and all kinds of things. Because I kept thinking, just keep putting more and more up on the walls, you'll be all right. Um, but to me, it, it, I have to really, really work to make sure I understand what's going on. Um, and hopefully I can find people who can help tell that story. I really find that finding some small uh, piece of information that someone can tell me and then can personify helps do that. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm Adam. I'm a, I'm a freshman hoping to get into computer engineering. Uh, here and I was when you guys were talking about underreported stories. It made me think of uh, genetic engineering and human designer babies and all that. And I wanted to know if any of you guys have any thoughts, opinions, if you've written on it, and what you think about the possible futures that it holds in regard. Anybody done any writing on genetic engineering in humans? Not me. Our colleagues do. It seems like CRISPR is an interesting topic. Right, and it seems like it's in a like a, a gene editing tool. That's all I know about it is to say it's a gene editing tool. Um, but it seems like it's still kind of in the early stages, and people are trying to find. You seem skeptical. <laughs> I, I was, it was the longest research paper I wrote. It was. I kind of realized during writing it that my opinion actually changed about it because it's a lot closer than we actually think. They have designed many of the techniques. It's mainly just like getting regulations through. So. It's a lot closer than we think. Yeah. So, so you just that's described a, oh, sorry. That's a huge hurdle, though. Regulations is a huge hurdle. Yeah. I think, I, I don't underestimate that, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, but, but I think also there's, um, so I'm, I'm, I hesitate to answer this because I haven't covered it in a little while. Um, but uh, there's certainly, I think there have been some hiccups in terms of um, uh, human trials, some of, the, some of the human trials of the of CRISPR in particular, um, but, but yeah, the regulation piece, I think, is, is probably what you're going to hear the most about um, in the coming years. But with regulations, what's going to stop someone from doing the bird scooter model where you just dump 100 bird scooters in town and then make sure your phone and your email are off and give people a smartphone and they start riding them around and the cities say and the universities say, we need help. And so they beat the regulation. I guess that becomes part of that that thing. I, I'm not sure regulation is going to stop technology from being technology. I don't know if it's going to stop it, but I'm I think that there's a um, there's still like so much that's being worked out there. Like I think it's I, I actually thought the technology was a little further lagging behind too. Um, but I think but no no I'm saying that there's there's still a lot to be done there. Yeah, I'm still right. trying to figure out what the bird scooter what it actually thing will be, of, right. of genetic. Engineering would be maybe yeah, I don't know bigger calves or you know <laughs> so there'd be something small right. that you could do but yeah, yeah. but we're yeah. likely to more likely to see it in medicine first right um, less a, as a, a designer baby and more of a of a tool for for trying to uh, treat some of these diseases but right but you've hit on a problem for um, right. science journalism like we really should you're saying that CRISPR is like on our doorsteps we should be paying attention to that. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Dam. I'm a grad student here at Purdue. And uh, I had a question, uh, Marina, you mentioned earlier that you have to find this balance between awesome discoveries that we find and being critical of 
you know, the people that produce it. So I'm curious specifically in like space reporting, how, how do you find the balance between um, cooperating with a source who, you know, might run a space company, might be, be a little egotistical, how do you? Who are you talking about? <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I'm just not saying names. Um, but how do you find the balance between cooperating with them and still being critical of them because they might not want to interact with you if you're extremely critical at the same time, you want to find that balance. So what steps do you do to ensure that balance? Right. Uh, well, I think uh, powerful people like the one that you alluded to, um, they expect uh, some antagonism from the press. They expect us to be critical, um, but they still want to get their stuff out there, so they have no choice but to talk to us. Um, from a more process perspective, I think I always try to warn my sources when I'm writing something about them that does not make them look good. And it's not because I'm trying to make them look bad, it's because they've done something that makes them look bad. Um, I had a great mentor in journalism who always said, don't stab any, anybody in the back, stab them in the front. Um, so just give them a heads up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you know, the, these people know that you have a job to do and you know that they have a job to do. So it's kind of understood in that source reporter relationship. Um, and also I would say it's, you know, give credit where credit is due. Um, the Falcon Heavy launch, for example, was an incredible achievement, but the way to do that is to inject a sense of wonder and history and context in your reporting, not to just tweet, oh my God, that was so cool. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, my name is Stuart, and I'm from Lafayette, and he kind of stole my thunder just a little bit, but I, I'm, I think I'm directing this question towards um, Ms. Snyder. Uh, when, when, when you do store, stories on autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. okay, the, it seems like from my observation is that the people who are pushing this technology, it's like the best thing since sliced bread and stuff like that, but the, and their analysis is that there are no problems, that this is going to you know, reduce you know, traffic deaths and all this other type of thing. But then the, you, in other venues, you see that they're saying pedestrians and cyclists and people like this are the biggest um, you know, hurdle that needs to be overcome. And the thing is, what I wonder is, when, you, when you're doing a story, is it better to do your positive stories and then later do a story um, um, concerning the minuses or try to combine those in, in one story? But the, 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 the problem I see with trying to combine it in one story is that usually you have a lot of you know, words about how wonderful it is and then you have a little tiny thing at the end saying, yeah, some people have some objections. And along, the, I, there are so many things happening right now. We're talking about the bird scooters and the attitude of uh, these tech companies. Like, my um, analogy from their point of view is, um, the, I, don't, I don't know if people remember bath salts, the drug bath mm. salts. And the thing is, on the bath, you, you have a little packet and it, and you pay 20 bucks for it or whatever, and it says right on it, don't ingest this. And if you look at the bird scooters, it says, don't ride them on the sidewalk. But of course, everybody's riding them on the sidewalk because it's you know, the most advantageous place to ride them. And so it seems like these tech companies are saying, well, don't, don't be evil, don't, you know, uh, the, the, you know the Tesla you know, autopilot is, you know, you, you need to pay attention to the road, but of course it, 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 the technology itself engenders a certain behavior. Right. So, um, so f for, for us, and I think for the people I, I, I work with um, on my team, particularly around autonomous vehicles, um, we talk a lot about sort of where the technology stands. Um, so, you know, I would, in some ways we almost like, I think most of our stories sort of invert it. So we wrote a story about, to launch our actually our whole coverage about um, how complex human driving is, that it's one of the most complex behaviors that we as humans do. Um, and then sort of looked at where, where we are from a technology standpoint. And yes, we included the sort of promise, but like 
but with a real sort of grounding as to where it stands now. So I guess that means we put both in there, um, but we really do lead with, or we aim to lead with where it actually stands. Um, yeah. Well, you see, one thing, a story that just came out very recently is the trolley problem. Uh -huh. and, and, and the thing is that, yeah, like it's making pedestrians and cyclists a little uneasy because it looks like from the tech company's point of view that the cyclists and the pedestrians are the ones that, that should be run over. So, and that they are collateral damage in the, you know, march to the future. Right. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a valid, that's a valid question and concern. And I think that that's something that they're obviously thinking about. And I mean, uh, you know, I think it's helpful to, rem to remember that where we are now is that there are pilot projects in very, um, you know, restricted areas within cities uh, that haven't moved beyond. These aren't, you know, going across Phoenix or from Phoenix to LA or anything like that yet. But it's it's a it's a valid question. I mean, that was a big that's a big ongoing study. I think it's the one we're talking about with the showed the cultural differences. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, so and obviously like a really important area. Um, and I think it's something that, it was nice to see the press pay so much attention to that. Um, and I think there are a lot of journalists um, and others, there are a lot of scientists and researchers and public policy makers and, like, and whatnot that are, um, that are waving the flag about those questions. Thank you. I think this may be our last question from the audience. Hi, um, I'm Helen Coates and I'm a writer for The Exponent. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more on how your approach to particularly the reporting process more than the writing process, um, has changed over the years, both as technology has changed and as you've learned more as journalists? It's a good question. Um, so as how has our reporting changed as technology has changed? Uh, I think that reporters um, have more um, platforms through, that they can use to report. Um, like I spend my time um, texting with sources or DMing with them on Twitter or on Instagram. Um, and that's kind of weird to think about because I use Instagram for, um, you know, for my social life, but there are sources that you can find there that are useful to you. So I think we today have more forms of connecting with people, people that we might not have reached otherwise. But I think that also can get tricky sometimes because the typical reporter source relationship has long been, you know, you talk to someone in person or on the phone and you decide whether that's on the record or off the record, you agree on your terms and they kind of know going in how they're gonna be presented in your story and how, they're, how that conversation is going to be used. Um, but if you're direct messaging someone on Twitter, for me as a reporter, that's always on the record because I'm presenting myself as a reporter, but because the source I'm talking to maybe uses Twitter for fun and not work, they'll think that this is just a fun little conversation. So I think as uh, we, technology grows and, and reporters have more ways to do their reporting, it's important to tell your source, especially if it's an you know, everyday person, not a politician, exactly what's happening and exactly how you're gonna use that information. Because I think that apps and social media can sometimes blur that line of communication. Yeah, I use social media a lot. Um, I mean, our social media used to be going to the mall to look to talk to people and try to get people until Simon kicked us all out. We had a report had uh, uh, notepads, um, but yeah, I, it's amazing how stories can change that way. Or um, I mean, just last week, the number of people who started talking about how touch screens at the Payless in White West Lafayette, which was one of our early voting sites, on one of the first days, people were pushing. Uh, the Democratic candidate, and it was skipping up to the Republican. And they were able to stop, they were able to see it and call for help, but I used that coming out of church and all of a sudden my DMs were going nuts, have you seen this? And by two o'clock, I had a story up about warning people you, how to do it and what the county was gonna do to fix it and all the rest of it. But it, it really is amazing what we can do that way. Thank you. Well, I think we are out of time, so if you could join me in thanking our wonderful panel of Allison, Marina, and Dave. Thank you.